Welcome to our visiting artist talk for belonging. We're so excited to have you with us in person, online, um, and we're super excited to have our artists with us to talk about their work. There's been so many students, there's been so many members of the art community in Monmouth County that have come into the show and have been so curious about so many of the pieces that we're able to display in this exhibit. So we're really excited tonight to have some of the artists with us so that we can hear from them firsthand about their process, but also how the call for, in, for, for um, for the concept of the show, right? The idea of belonging resonated with them, what that meant and how they chose to respond to it through their own, um, through their own creative process. So our first artist who is fantastic, um, absolutely fantastic. Um, so it has two of her pieces in the show, one that is uh, maybe more color than she's used to working with and one that has kind of its roots in COVID, I think a little bit, right? Um, so I'm gonna pass the mic off and let you introduce yourself. Tell us all about yourself and then all about your work. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, it's really nice to be here. Hello everybody, my name is Kate Eggleston. I see some familiar faces. Thank you for braving the definitely cold weather tonight. And hello to you at home on the internet. This is fantastic. Uh, so yeah, my name is Kate Eggleston. Um, I've been a Monmouth Arts Council member for a number of years now. I am an artist. I'm also a project manager at a set and prop shop in Freehold, and I also am an art educator. I've been teaching for about uh, 16 years now. Boy, that number seems a lot. Um, <laughs> kind of creeps up on you a little bit by little bit. Um, I've been living in Monmouth County for about six years now, and I am so glad I made the move because the art scene here is so cool. We have so many good things here. And I really hope that you all at home, if you haven't come, that you will come and see this show because it is spectacular. The caliber of work in this show is incredible. And I'm specifically talking about the student work, which is unbelievably amazing. You have to get out here. So a little promo right there. So, <laughs> um, so I have uh, two pieces in this show. Um, let me just back up for one more second, is uh, my home disciplines that I work in the studio. So I work in a little room in my house. Sometimes I take over the dining room table. Uh, my home disciplines are textiles, drawing, and printmaking. And I do a lot of sculpture as well. And sometimes those things intersect and bleed into each other. I feel like as an artist, you need to work on multiple things at the same time, so that way you don't feel so crowded and stuck into what you're already accomplishing. So usually I'm working on multiple pieces at the same time, such as these two pieces. Um, so the piece that is farthest, that's in the black and white, um, that particular piece was created during COVID. And as I said, I work in textiles a lot, so I'm sewing, I'm dyeing fabrics, and working um, with uh, textiles in that regard. That bleeds into my drawing and printmaking significantly. So if I'm not actually making a stitch, I'm usually drawing a stitch. Uh, those kind of mark making, obsessive, repetitive marks help me relax and help my depression and anxiety. Um, I know that we all experience that varying levels during those two years of kind of lockdown-ish for us here in the United States. So I kept making these marks and making these marks and filling page after page and thinking, well, what else can I do with this? So I started encapsulating them in these kind of amorphic figures. They started out as kind of markers for uh, flora and landscape and then they turn into people and then of course as an artist you're always like, well that's me. You know, you always put yourself into your work in one way or the other. So um, that particular piece is called The Contents Don't Match the Vessel. Um, the way that I felt that it fit with the prompt of belonging is that we all don't feel like we fit 100% of the time. Um, square pegs, round holes, and that sort of thing. So that's what I had in my mind. Um, I also like work that, my own personal aesthetic work that I like to have in my house always has some sort of little quirk to it. So one of the figures is upside down. It kind of makes me think of my daughter, who is nine, but is very squishy and moves around a lot. And anytime she hugs me, she can't sit still. So it's kind of a callback to that as well. The uh, other piece, which has similar figures in it, so this particular set of figures and obsessive repetitive mark making 
um, has filtered through my work for the last three years now at least. Um, it started during the pandemic. Um, I had a wonderful solo show at Smush Gallery in Jersey City and it had walls of these particular figures in different environments, um, color, black and white, and varied in between. Um, and so over the last year, I extended and kept going with this motif. As you can see with the repetitive mark making, I like to get repetitive and obsessive with my own work in general. So I'll exhaust an idea until it's completely run its course. But if you're working in different mediums and checking out different things, uh, simultaneously, you kind of find that there really is no way to exhaust anything. There's only more to uncover, which is fantastic. Even if you're making terrible stuff, just keep making. You'll get to the good stuff. Um, so I was working very monochromatically for a very long time as an artist, um, and I am uncomfortable with really bright colors in general. Um, and uh, it was mentioned that I did need to cover this up when it was in the studio because it was so distracting on a daily basis to have to look at it because the color is so bright and all of the things happening in it, it would get really claustrophobic in my little room looking at this painting across the way. So um, this particular piece was worked on when I was in residence at uh, Shaw North in Pine Plains, uh, upstate New York, really wonderful artist residency if you ever get the chance. Um, I went to the local Ben Moore store, picked the most obnoxious red I could possibly find, which is like siesta or fiesta. It was very flamboyant color. And I thought, well, what's something else that I learned in art school that was a big no-no? Oh, red on red, that's a good one. So let's get as obnoxious with the color as possible. So I started with the red base. I knew I wanted to put the black and white figures in there at some point and get my little hatch marks in. Um, I had also been working on some fiber pieces that consisted of uh, scraps from uh, Santa Hats, which was a side gig I've been doing for a number of years for a company in New Jersey. <laughs> Why not? And um, I had been making these little cellular structures with these Santa Hats because they had a lot of red and a lot of other little colors, so became these clusters. Um, and I just kept adding and adding and adding and adding and making it kind of a hot mess in my own mind, but when you are this close to something for weeks, and then you finally take a step back and get some distance from your work, you realize, you know what, this is, this is working, this is great. I actually did something worth looking at and worth sharing. So the title of this piece is Halt, Hungry, Angry, Lonely, Tired. That's a callback to a, a therapeutic catchphrase that when you're in a state of stress, think to yourself, halt, go through those four words and see if any of those apply to how you're feeling at the time. We all feel those things at varying levels at all times, um, even though pretend, potentially the surface is showing us something different. Um, and I feel like it's really important to lean into that discomfort and um, address it before it starts to fester. You need to process what you're going through, like what to do with that emotional energy are you gonna take it somewhere positive or negative? Like address the negative, look at that negative, and then make something great of it. Take that energy and put it somewhere else. So that piece embodies that for me in particular, not just because of the visuals, which is what I was using to kind of convey that discomfort and all the activity and the dripping and the clusters and the hatch marks and all this obsessive repetitiveness, um, using color as well to visually lean into that discomfort and hopefully resolve some of it for myself. So, yeah, thank you very much. And I just want to let you know there's been so many folks who have come into the gallery and they love your piece and they're drawn to it and then they read, they read what it's called, right? They read Halt and they're like, yes. 100% I get that, right? That it resonates. So it's been really fun kind of just to get to see people really respond exactly like you're saying. Like, am I hungry? What's going on? Um, and just kind of checking in that way. And then having art kind of centered around that. And I do have to say, we've lived with this for how many, how many like just weeks on the wall. And this is the first time I noticed that one of your figures is upside down. So, if you, so I'm so glad you were here to tell us about that today because we think we're such good lookers. And then you never know what you're missing, right? Good work, there's always something to find later, right? Yeah. There's always something to explore and see, so. Yeah. yeah, and you helped us yet tonight. So thank you so much for that, Key, I appreciate it. Um, 
Okay, so our next artist, we're gonna have a, just a moment, and we're realizing now that we never discussed how we would flip the art, but we need to flip the art. Um, so our next artist is actually um, joining us from Zoom, Barbara Rousseau. So there's Barbara. Hi, Barbara, how are you? Excellent, excellent. So we're just gonna take a quick moment and we're gonna bring Barbara's art um, here so that we can see it. Barbara, while we're changing the art, would you like to introduce yourself to the room and to the folks on Zoom? And then we can go into um, your engagement with the concept and your artwork in particular. Okay, uh, my name is Barbara Russo. I'm an exhibiting artist at um, the Guild of Creative Art in Shrewsbury and I'm also the co-president down there. Um, as my art career, I've been uh, in art ever since I've been a child. My father was an abstract artist. So, and I was a graphic designer for 20 years and for 10 years, I was a multimedia art director, which was a fantastic job. So I'm retired now and I'm here uh, enjoying my retirement and doing my art. Uh, so they are um, small pieces. They're all nine by nine squares um, and um, I guess, first before I begin, I wanna say that I, I love making art because I do like the process. I'm, I'm very structured in how I work. So I don't just go to the canvas and begin, which I guess maybe I did that a long time ago, but as a graphic designer, I've learned to be very organized and, and very disciplined. So I really follow that out in my artwork and it does help me to relax. Um, most of my work is done in series, so this set of series are all called orbs. Um, and I started creating, uh, I was doing just orbs. And then during the pandemic, I started to add the figures to the orbs, playing with them, working with them. Because um, I guess I felt um, we were all so isolated, but we all needed each other. Um, I guess that's the feeling of belonging. And um, by putting the people in the artwork, it kind of gave me a, a feeling like I was, we were, we were working together. The, the figures were working with the orbs. And, and um, I guess when I create my artwork, my goal is to, to really balance it with uh, line, shape, form, and texture. And I'm looking for a design to have movement. Um, and I start out with an idea. Sometimes it comes to me while I'm in ShopRite or wherever. Um, and I will sketch that idea out at the same format. It's a nine by nine. I sketch it out, it's very tight. Um, and then I work within the square because I like the juxtaposition between the circles and the squares. And um, when I'm satisfied with the design, I take a picture of it with my iPhone and then I look at it in a different perspective and I know I can share it with someone and get some feedback. Um, and at that point, I will kind of make some adjustments and move all the orbs because the orbs are separate pieces. Um, they are, um, I, I cut them out, I draw them and then I cut them out. And I, I actually like doing them because they're all different patterns. I love patterns. And I also do it while I'm watching television. So it's really relaxing and I don't have to really get involved in watching TV that much. Um, and I will then place the orbs where I want them. And then I put a tracing paper over that and I place the people where I want them to be. And um, at this point, um, when I'm satisfied with it, the tracing paper then is substituted for acetate. And each of uh, the layer, then there will be three layers. There's the layer of the orbs in the background. There's a layer of orbs on acetate. And then there's a layer of people on acetate. So the, uh, the goal is to have the viewer be able to see the shadows and walk around. And there's, there's sort of a movement in the, in the work. Um, I, I, I like the, the fact that when I put them all together and they're all spaced by a three quarter inch space with inside the shadow box frame. And um, I'll place them there and then I'll, 
I'll look at them and try to give them a name of what I feel is appropriate for them. Um, and so in this one here, it's called posing with orbs. Um, and I have to be very careful when I'm doing it so that when they're separated, when each layer is separated, they still have the same orientation. The middle dancer, her toe is on that ball. And when you move in one direction, her toe is still on that ball, but her shadow is now in a little different direction. So it kind of plays around with uh, the space and the three-dimensional feeling. And in the other one, which is called uh, playing with orbs, I had put all the orbs together and then I just felt like it just needed the people at the bottom, just kind of kicking them up in the air and pump, pushing them with their finger. It's kind of just a light feeling um, to be able to, you know, have these little characters standing on little orbs. And it's just, it's, it's a fun, to me, it's fun to create them. Uh, right now I'm working on one calling and I'm gonna call it people with balloons. And it just kind of, just kind of all works where it's kind of light and, you know, I think, and it also makes a interesting, um, and each, each orb is very different. So each orb has its own character. And it kind of keeps you involved when you're looking at them, that each one of them um, has a different look to them. And yet they sort of seem to always fall into the same palette because I just kind of like that uh, keeping not, you know, lots of color. I'm very subdued in the way I dress and the way I act. So I think that that's what, what comes out in my artwork. So I feel like, um, I feel like I'm, when I'm doing art, I try to be as um, honest and straightforward as I possibly can. And I like to leave a lot to the viewer's imagination. And um, because I think as a dynamic piece of art is um, something between the viewer and the artist. So um, that's my take on my art. Thank you so much, Barbara. And I and we say this a lot. We say this to our students. Um, and sometimes we have to remind ourselves too, especially after COVID, that some artwork really needs to be seen in person. And Barbara, uh, yours is absolutely in that category. When Connie, when you when you came and dropped your work for the show, um, Connie and I looked at your pieces and the dimensionality of it wasn't apparent to us in the images that we'd seen, the digital images of your work, and we were blown away. Um, so, so it's really kind of a great example of even, you know, even if we're watching this on broadcast or we're watching this on Zoom, if you can, when you can, you really need to come in and see it in person because the depth and the layers that you're discussing really don't translate unless you're, you're standing in front of it in person and light, light can play and you can have that sort of that, that, per, that, that experience of perception. Um, so that's, that's just really a delightful kind of discovery for us in the show. Um, and we've really, we've really enjoyed it. So thank you so much for your work. Well, thank you. And actually you do have it in, the lighting that you have it in is just perfect and at the height that it is. So thank you for uh, displaying it that way. Yeah, we have a good team. All right, so thank you so much. So next we're going, we're going to have sculpture that we're going to have to look at. Uh, we're going to get to look at, not have to, uh, get to look at. Um, so we, ha we, have, to, we get, have to get it out. Um, so we're going to get Judy's work out. And then um, Judy, while we're bringing your sculpture out, would you like to just introduce yourself and, and, and get your comments started for the, for the group? I can tell you a little bit about um, what I have coming up. Um, I'll just say um, I've lived in um, Monmouth County now over 25 years. Um, my husband and myself have raised our kids here and it's been quite the journey. My art journey has gone from uh, fashion designer to pottery to um, decorative sculpture to contemporary um, art as sculpture, which has basically uh, occurred over the past like mm, two plus years. I started moving into this um, category uh, prior to COVID and then COVID really gave me the time to do a post-baccalaureate through UMass Dartmouth um, 
virtually and I have my own studio. So I was able to work that way. I just want to say being part of the belonging exhibit and having it be um, in memoriam and a tribute to Charlie Sills, um, my husband is in particular and I knew Dr. Sills and I've met his wife before, lovely. Um, and it's so wonderful to be part of something that honors him. And I remember talking to him about uh, his artwork at the time he was doing a life-size um, um, I think it was a tic-tac-toe board and he was just such a character and he had such great creativity and to be part of a show that's honoring him is really an honor for me. That said, um, my work is um, about uh, connection and entanglement. So the belonging theme uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, my work is, um, you know, it's biomorphic abstraction, which basically means um, it's not based uh, to look specifically like um, something in particular. It pulls from nature, it pulls from uh, the human body, it pulls from texture that we see in the world, and it also just pulls from line and form. And so um, basically, um, I'm speaking to uh, all of the systems that we see in nature and in the human body and in our society. And um, I'm thinking about how each of these systems is so complex and interesting and, and how yet we're all part of a, a, obviously a much larger system and it's all connected under that umbrella. And then as I'm working, I have found a way of working that is playing with both line and form and line, um, where form is actually becoming line. So my work is um, uh, uh, fired clay that I have hand built. I usually use coils and I build up the structure. I usually have an idea. I work with um, drawing. I have a kind of a separate drawing practice that's part of this. I know I just said it was separate, but basically I, um, I don't necessarily do uh, a drawing of the piece. I may do sort of a gestural image of what I'm trying to say in the piece, like the one, um, uh, the taller piece with the knot on top is called knot, very simple, or sorry, it's called tied, <laughs> very simple. But what I was trying to speak to there was that actual a feeling of a of a tying and a, and an entanglement there, whereas the other piece is called uh, preserve, and so it sort of folds upon itself, and the energy um, is in the middle of that one. It, it's the pieces all kind of come together in the middle, and it is one continual form. Same with tide, which uh, focuses more on that negative space in the middle and sort of the energy that develops there as well. Um, and what I do is I will build the structure based on my initial gestural sketch. And then I might go and start to build it and then start to draw part of it and think about how I want that to be, um, specifically constructed. And then I go back to the piece and I, and I work some more uh, physically that way. And then additionally, I uh, fire the piece. I, um, I paint the piece with, uh, actually I've been using spray paint and it, it's a flat surface, like a matte surface, which you're not able to see right now. <laughs> if you are far away, if you're in person, please go up, look closely. Um, it's, um, it's basically a smooth surface that I'm most comfortable with to create almost the feeling of paper, because what I then do is I go in with um, a 
a drawing utensil. I, I work mainly with pencils and, um, and I draw uh, individual lines that connect and entangle and some separate, some come together, they twist, sort of restating this connection and energy. Um, where you do see larger parts, um, I have come to the realization that I, um, it's okay for me to use some graphite powder that I mix with um, acrylic uh, matte medium. And that allows me to spread it in larger parts, especially on my larger sculptures. These are on the smaller side for me. And basically I will work that way. And then I'll go back to the drawing and the white parts that you see online are actually still covered in these cases with very thin, uh, lighter lines. I work with all different um, grades of pencil and, um, and you know, I'm able to kind of go back and forth and the spray paint sort of allows me to erase if I need to at any point and rework a piece. And, um, and yeah, I mean, basically the lines sort of layer on top of each other. I do work with a matte spray varnish. And when I do that, um, I, I even get sort of a layering occasionally of the line upon the line um, because the varnish almost creates um, an isolation effect of the, of the uh, layers beneath. And so I'm sort of playing with this idea of that overriding theme. And yet I'm also playing with the idea of, you know, working that way. I'm working with parts that come together that I entangle. Um, these are individual uh, self-contained pieces, but when I work larger, I often work with multiple pieces that in fact connect to form a whole um, or they are laid out, which you can see on my website or on my Instagram, um, Judy Tavel Art <laughs> with an I. But basically, just to give you a better indication um, of what I do. Um, and, um, and in doing that, I just, um, I'm sort of, it's very meta in the sense that I'm like doing what I'm talking about as well, I feel. And, and on top of it, I'm also working in a way that is about um, line as sculpture and sculpture as line or form. And so um, the actual forms themselves have a tendency tendency to almost feel like line that has become form. And then we have this drawing on top of it um, that uh, re-emphasizes that. So this is definitely where my work has sort of been born out of my, uh, my focus to really delve into what did I want to say in my work, whereas my work before was more about design and, um, and material. It's still about material, and I can't throw out the design, but I do have a lot of emphasis on um, what I want to say in terms of the essence of each piece. And that's where, like, um, preserve um, uh, to your right, I guess, is, um, is more about preserving that energy. And then tide is more about sort of the expression of how it feels to see a tie or a joining together. So that's basically what you see here. And hearing you talk about this idea of gestural drawing, right? So our architecture students would call that making a messy model. Um, and I think it's really so lovely kind of that, that flexibility to just play between two-dimensional drawing and sketching and three-dimensional drawing and sketching and just let the work be what it wants to be and not feel like we can only work in, in one way, right? Um, and there's something, you know, it's, abstraction is so hard, it's so difficult, and there's something so compelling um, about the way you're abstracting this idea of line. It feels so embedded with meaning about belonging for us when we were looking at this um, 
you know, the way, the way you're taking the line and you're just letting it fold in on itself and you're letting it belong to itself almost in some ways and sort of creating that continuity that we all maybe long for in community, especially when we're going through COVID, when we're isolated, when we're not together in community as we maybe want to be. Um, so, and, it, and, it's, and it's so embedded in the tradition of art, right? Paul Klee, Eva Hesse, that, you know, you're picking up this idea of that foundational element of line, just like belonging as such a foundational human, like just desire. Um, and you're bringing so much out of it. Um, it's been great getting to see people come in and realize what your work is as they get, like, just like you were saying, as they get closer, they're like, what, what is that? How did she do that? What's happening? Um, and then all of a sudden they get close enough and they're like, oh my gosh, that's <laughs> like, um, so it's just, it, you know, I hear you talking about the word play. Um, we talk about play so much in design. Paula Cher has a great TED talk where she talks about um, design as play. Um, and there is, there's something somber and serious and intentional, but also playful about your work. Um, yeah. So we're so grateful that you were able to share it with us. And we can't wait to see you in here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks you so much for being with us. I'm Justin Domatico. Um, hi, everybody on Zoom. Um, thanks for being here. Um, I'm 24. I'm from Old Bridge, New Jersey. Uh, represent. Um, I am, that's OK. I'm an adjunct professor here at Brookdale. Um, this is my first semester. I teach drawing. Um, I just graduated with my master's degree back in June from SCAD in painting. Um, that's where this work is inspired from, from my thesis. Um, so this piece is called I Dream of Forests, and this is actually its second iteration. So it started off as a very small scale work that was done for my um, review that I had to do at one point last year. And it was kind of my changing point in my artwork where things really started to take a new shift. Um, I started to get away from classical representations and working methods of painting and move into more modern, brighter color palettes. Um, and the basis of this work couldn't fit more with the theme of this show, I think, if I tried. Um, the idea of belonging in my work is extremely strong because I really want to create through these other worlds, or as other people have described them to me, alien-like environments, as um, a place where everyone can come and be accepted as they really are. Um, I think it's really important that we kind of have that foundation in our society with so much hate being spread. Um, when I was an undergrad, I was a psychology minor, so I tied that into this work as well. There was this idea that we studied under Carl Jung about um, the universal consciousness and how that there were these archetypes that you could find throughout society that um, even societies that didn't speak to one another, that were across continents, had these same symbols that would pop up over and over, um, and these same kind of stories that somehow, some way, humanity kind of invented over and over. And I think that our society now kind of lacks that idea of symbolism a little bit, and I'm trying to bring that back. So everything that you see within these pieces, and any of my pieces for the most part, have some kind of symbolic meaning. Whether you take it that way or not, it's really up to the viewer. But um, for example, the peacock um, is a big motif that I've been using lately. I wanted to create an environment where someone that could be in the LGBTQ community and also be a devout Christian could um, find a place to exist. Um, they're two things that kind of oppose each other greatly. Um, and I think that the, I couldn't have found a better symbol um, the peacock could be used as um, a motif for God. A lot of society has said that the, the feathers in the tail um, are representative of the eye of God, and I thought that that was really interesting to tie in. But I also found through my research that there were some societies, especially in Eastern culture, that thought um, of the peacock as a representation of the LGBTQ uh, community because um, peacocks, and I didn't know this, could eat venomous snakes and be completely unharmed from the, the venom. And then they thought through that, um, the venom would turn into the iridescent color of the feathers. So it's a, it's a look at resilience in the peacock. And I think that tying those together really um, shows that both can exhibit uh, and exist um, harmoniously in our society, that you don't have to be boxed into one particular um, 
niche, I guess, like, for lack of a better word. Um, I think that the big thing that I'm trying to portray through the work is that when you see these brightly colored paintings that are you know, really saturated, really bright, um, rather than something that's a little bit more realistic, you kind of have to leave societal norms at the door when you kind of enter into these worlds. Um, they create this foreign sense, but almost a sense of familiarity at the same time that we can't really bring our ideas and um, predisposed judgments into them. Um, they have to be left behind, and you have to walk into these worlds and understand that there isn't, you don't understand the rules of this society, you don't understand the rules of this world, that there are things that you can't bring in that may offend somebody that lives in that world, per se. Um, we don't understand the rules of that. If you, if you turned around tomorrow and a Martian came to Earth, we don't know what Martian culture would be like. Um, so, you know, it, it, you have to kind of take a step back and keep an open mind when you look, enter into these environments. So one thing hearing you talk about your work that I really love um, is so often when we think about pride and LGBTQ, um, we think about a rainbow, yes. right? And the rainbow flag is a very important symbol, it's a very important icon, um, but sometimes it almost feels heavy handed, it seems overused, right? Um, and so I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you know, does that have a, you know, does that come into play for your thinking about looking at a peacock instead? Like, is that something that you're looking to pluralize? Um, you know, the, the symbolism is so clear, um, but the meaning um, is, is, you know, something that we need you to tell us about. Yes. Um, and I think it adds a depth that isn't always there when we just see a rainbow flag and hat and bus and, right? So can, can, you, can you share a little bit about sure. that? Um, so I think that a big thing that I was trying to get across is that um, I don't want to use stereotypical symbols. Um, if I was to depict this person with a cross around their neck and a peacock that was painted or you know, and draped in a rainbow flag, um, I think that gives you a little bit too much at surface value. And what I'm trying to uh, get across in the work is that symbols have different meaning to everybody. So what I may view um, the meaning of the symbol may be different to somebody else. Um, it may be different to someone in China. It may be different to someone in Australia. Um, you can look at this work, and I'm sure everybody could probably take a different meaning away from it. But at the end of the day, um, really, I want you to understand, and what, what it's being shown in the work is just that idea of open-mindedness. Um, I'm open to any interpretation that you may take away from my painting, just as I would hope that you would be open to any interpretation that I um, show you through it. Um, does that make sense? Yeah? Wow, there's two mics. It turns Perfect. Out. Now we can chat more. Sure. I love that. <laughs> two mics, imagine. There's actually like eight, so y'all are welcome to jump in if you'd like. Um, yeah, I, and I have to say that really came across for us. Yeah. Um, this feels like a place where, you know, and, and as you said in your artist statement, mm -hmm. where we can belong, we can kind of climb in. Yeah. Um, I've been doing, we're looking at the idea of doing a show on Afrofuturism next spring. Ah! And so, I know. As, so as we're researching that and thinking about what does that look like, what does that feel like, where does that come from, we've do, been doing a lot of reading of Octavia Butler, mm -hmm. right? So Octavia Butler is almost like the, the science fiction version of a little bit of what you're doing, right? Yes. Octavia Butler um, was an African-American woman writing in the 60s and 70s, and, and she didn't fit in. So she created these fictive worlds where she could be the badass that she was. Mm -hmm. And that was what her writing was. She discovered, she, she wrote these incredible science fiction wor worlds. And then in so many instances, some version of her really mm -hmm. was kind of like the, this central figure. Definitely. Um, and and it, so there's almost something, you know, this feels like a science fiction moment yeah. for me. Is that, is that a fair? I, I would say so. I, like I said, I've, I've heard it all, all different types of ways, and I've had many people, I've had alien-like come across more times than I can count. Yeah. Um, surreal, um, dreamlike, and I really think that that taps into a little bit of the psychology background that I have, too, because I, I absolutely love surrealism. Um, but I, I, I think that there's that this openness that, that you kind of get within them, and if you saw... Um, there's about 10 paintings in this series right now, and hopefully more to come. Um, each one gets a little bit different, a little bit more um, strange and odd, depending on what the subject matter is. And you'll see, it's not portrayed in this one, but in some of the other paintings I have, I have these ideas called portals. Um, and through those portals, there are different kinds of shapes that you may see a triangle, um, a moon in one of them, um, allows the natural world to also seep into them. So that gives you an, an escape to leave the world if you wanted to, so you're not 
completely trapped in. Yeah, yeah, we can design the world that we want to live in. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, is there anything else you want to tell us about? Because this has been wonderful to get you to hear about your work. Um, I don't think so. I think we covered it all. I love it. it. I we have questions. Oh, we have a sure. good thing I have a second mic. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I first want to say I think the painting's really nice. I think the peacock is rather beautiful. Thank you. But I am a little confused. I just want to ask about the belonging aspect because you sure. did mention it fits uh, a lot into that uh, that word. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this and listening to you describing the alien world, a place where maybe you don't understand the customs and a place you can even feel trapped in. And I just want to hear a bit more of why that would be something you would belong to. Sure. So um, the way that I look at it as um, when you enter this world, um, free from those societal judgments that you may have and those kinds of um, norms that come across with other things, some, some hateful things or derogatory words or something like that, it gives you the opportunity to have a more open mind to kind of express yourself and feel a little less harm. So, in almost all the paintings that you see, it's usually a solo um, figure. So they kind of exist by themselves, and it gives them that space to kind of just be who they are and to, to, to make the world what they want it to be. Kind of like, um, like if the, the beginning of the Bible, like Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, they, uh, they, have their, they have the garden, it's created, and they kind of start to build and create that, that life for themselves. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you for sharing your work. Thank you. So we have our last, um, our last artist, our last work that we really need to talk about. So I'm so excited that you're with us, Louis. <laughs> There's so many questions. So many people need to talk about this work. So we're, we're waiting to bring out our last piece. Um, this is a piece you maybe saw in some of our advertisement for the show. Um, this is a really, really important piece for us to be able to speak about tonight. Um, and if it's OK, I'd like to just introduce you know, one of the things that we've been thinking about for this piece. And I'm not going to give it all away. I'm going to let you do that, Louise. But I will say, um, for those of you who are students of art history, um, maybe you remember um, when Marcel Duchamp famously um, submitted a, a urinal as a work of art, right? A ready-made, right? The, the first ready-made, I think that was. And he asked us the question, right? He asked the question, is it art? Is it art? Um, and I think you have the 21st century version of that question for us. So I'm going to turn my mic off, and I'm very excited to get to hear you speak about your work, Louise. Thank you for joining okay, us. Okay, thank you. And I... It's so teeny, isn't it? <laughs> I'm so impressed by the presentations of the other artists. Um, I am actually an anthropologist who has recently retired and I'm doing art full time now. I used to be a photographer many, many years ago and I switched back and forth between being an anthropologist studying metaphor and symbolism and being an artist actually producing art. Um, and since I've retired, I've started doing uh, mixed media work, uh, a lot of it now um, based in fiber arts. Um, let, let me take a step back. I became a miniaturist, <laughs> which was creating miniature dioramas for the Philadelphia Flower Show. And um, in addition to uh, a scene that you create, you had to have plants that were the right size. So a lot of my work is about looking at small things and getting sort of a big meaning out of them. So um, I'm going to tell you about this work and I'm going to share my screen so I can show you a few other things um, and uh, let you know what the process is. I don't have formal art training other than looking at thousands of artworks in hundreds of museum shows over the years. So that's my training. I can't draw, but this particular technique that I'm about to show you has become magical for me because now I can do anything I want. So here we go. I'm gonna share my screen. So let's make sure that that works. Can you guys see my screen? I just need a yes. 
can see your screen. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, in terms of the theme of the show of the show belonging, it was really a good one for me um, because hold on because um, I lost my community as an anthropologist and so had to find a new one among artists. And um, one of the things I like to do, which is related neither to my art or to anthropology, is a sky gazing or stargazing, whatever you want to call it. And I love going out. I have a big telescope and going out and looking at the planets and the moon and meteor showers and so on. And I always had the fantasy of having a group of people, mostly women, who would go to the beach with me and watch meteor showers because um, going to the beach alone is a little dangerous uh, in different parts of New Jersey at night. So um, that that is my sense of the theme of belonging, um, that I really wanted to belong to a group that did that. And the funny thing is recently I found a, a woman artist who made a wonderful fiber arts piece that was called Stargazer. And so I bought it from her and we had this wonderful conversation about sort of the connection between staring at the skies and, and being an artist. Okay, so this piece um, is what is called an AI, artificial intelligence generated image. It is printed on canvas, hand stitched, and then enhanced in other ways. And the way AI works, and we're going to talk about the controversy about it, but the way it works is you come up with a text prompt. And I've made over a thousand of these practicing what are the best prompts to use. And this is based on the following text prompt. A surrealist painting of five old women from the back in a Anna Mendieta style mud sculpture with a meteor shower up above. And you're required when you use the particular program I'm using, which is called DALI, to um, give credit to the AI program, which is why this is um, listed on, uh, on my work. So the question is, yeah, is this art? But it, it's more than that. For me, and a lot of the work uh, a lot of the prompts I use are based on surrealist artists, not only because I really like surrealism, but because surrealists had this fantasy a hundred years ago to do the following thing. And I'm going to actually get to my quote. They wanted to reproduce the actual functioning of human thought. And they tried all sorts of ways to do it and they did the exquisite corpse and they did um, mixed media and they did object uh, um, sculptures and never really achieved what they thought was possible, which is to take unconscious thoughts, dreams, and just ideas and in a sense, instantly generate art. Now you can do it, <laughs> at least now I can do it. Um, so I'm going to show you some ideas. So the program I use is called Doll E, and it's a play, it's a play, of course, on Dolly, uh, the artist Dolly, but also on um, Wally, -E, the Disney movie. So if you didn't ever get that before, it's a really cool program. I signed up as one of the early users, and now it's open up to everybody, and it costs money. Uh, you get free credits, and then you have to pay for it. But I have fun. Okay, so in terms of a theme like belonging, um, you could put in, like I did here, a Merritt Oppenheim sculpture of belonging. That's not how I work, but I, I thought I'd show you this because I'm about to go off to the Merritt Oppenheim show at MoMA. But um, this sculpture that came up has absolutely nothing to do with Merritt Oppen Oppenheim's work because I've looked at tons and tons of it in pre preparation to see her show. So you can't think of this as just sort of imitating the artist 
whose prompts you use. So here's how it works. So back to this, it's based on the following text prompt, a surrealist painting, painting of five old women. And I use old women specifically because um, every time I've used it, I get a very particular form. Um, uh, viewing from the back because they are, this program and most AI is terrible with faces. And I wanted to do uh, an Anna Mendieta mud sculpture because I like the form. This reminds me of um, uh, some of the other work that we've seen so far in the talks, which is really kind of interesting, uh, the forms of the females. And they're looking up at a meteor shower. So when I did that prompt, however, that's not the only one that came up. There, are, there were three or there were more than three, there were six that came up and I chose these three and I did stitching on these three. So when you put a prompt in, when you ask a computer to generate an image, it's not doing a sort of simplistic, you said five women and so I'm gonna put in five women. I mean, you could look at these and it's like, what is, what is the connection between these? And I love this because it has that element of randomness that um, I would not have come up with these three or you'll see six more images on my own. And for me, they're just a starting point. This is not the final result. This is a starting point for what I want to create. Oops, go back. So that same prompt came up with the first five images you see here. Sometimes the images are good. Um, I'm, I just printed up this one and I'm gonna stitch it. The other ones, I love this one, but I don't, <laughs> don't know what to do with it. This particular, the one on the bottom row in the center is really awful. And then the one on the bottom row to, the, to my right um, is the same five women looking up at the sun. And what I love about this process is you don't know what you're going to get. It's not predictive. What Dolly and these other programs are doing is pulling from the literally billions of images that are out there that have been created by artists and our photographs and drawings and maps. And, and it takes little elements from them and creates a unique image. And if I were to put this prompt in again, so actually I put the prompt in again and got the second four images, you, you never get the same thing. So that it's not um, using a sort of rote memory of what it gave you before. It's giving you possibilities. And I love the idea that I don't know what it's going to do. I'm not totally in control of the image being created. This is another image that I did and did stitching with it. So um, Max Ernst really works well for me in these generations. I don't particularly care for his artwork, but uh, in doing hundreds, <coughs> excuse me, hundreds and hundreds of tests of uh, different artists, uh, Max Ernst stands out. But here's a real wacky um, generation. So this is, the prompt is a Max Ernst painting of the back view of three witches juggling milk bottles at sunset in a field. But it's got the milk bottles doing the juggling instead of three witches who don't, don't appear anywhere. So again, that sort of randomness is really, to me, really delightful. Um, this is a Dorothea Tanning painting so for your for you art students, you really need to know your artists um, and you need to know that you can throw a whole bunch of different artists and see what they're, what's going to get generated. But this is a Dorothea Tanning painting. I love her work of a witch running after blackbirds in a field. And all of the images I create, I take into Photoshop. You have to clean them up um, and <laughs> and then I decide to stitch them. Now you'll see the one that's in the show here is already stretched on a canvas. And that was dumb because it's really hard to stitch when something has a canvas frame. So I learned that I could use a very long um, needle 
like really long, like six to nine inches long needle and stick it up into the corners and stitch that way. So it was actually a very fun experiment. Uh, it, it's a, a needle for doing furniture. So as I said, I have done hundreds of these, just hundreds. And it's just a delight, for me, a delightful process. For other people, it's controversial because, well, why can't I draw these things and then embroider them or paint them or whatever? I can't draw. And I can't, I have, my son thinks this is fascinating for me. He thinks this is the perfect thing because I have lots of ideas in my head and I don't know how to get them out. And now I can get them out. Maybe not a good thing, <laughs> but um, they, for me, it's a really exciting thing to say something and see an image. So a big part of my work in anthropology is how people tell stories, how they generate community through the stories they tell and through the language that they use. And for me, artificial intelligence generation of images is exactly that. You need to know how to organize your language so that it creates a picture for your audience that somehow connects to the language. And so the anthropologist in me always comes back around, <laughs> no matter how hard I try. Um, I just wanted to show you this one. So in addition to the other Merritt Hoppenheim sculpture belonging, belonging, you get stuff like this. Now this is kind of cool. I could do something with, this, with it, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the theme. Um, okay, so that's it in terms of sharing my screen. And I am happy to take questions or have a discussion about the possibilities of artificial intelligence, the controversy. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hold on. There we go. Um, the controversy uh, is that this is fake art or that um, you're going to be trying to deceive people about what you're doing. So there was a guy in an art show and he won the something, he won the digital art stuff. And he said, this is the end of art. Guess what? This is the beginning of a new kind of art that I don't know, I don't know a lot of people doing this, but no artist I know will take one of these generated images, which are totally bizarre in many ways, and do nothing with it. So they'll paint it, they'll collage it, they'll stitch it, they'll cut it up and make other things with it. Um, so that there's nothing to fear about something that's computer generated, because we most of us work in Photoshop and do that in various ways anyway. So let me leave that idea there and come back to you for questions. Hi, I um I just had a question. Um, as someone who's like very active in the digital art space and on social media, um, the topic of the Dolly E and other like um, artificial intelligence uh, image generators has come up as more of a huge ethical question. Um, for me personally, I post my art a lot online um, and I personally feel very uncomfortable with the idea of these auto-generating programs using my artwork as reference um, because I know like artificial intelligence, it only does what it's taught and it's taught through reference of other images. Um, so I just wanted to ask like, what do you think ethically about these um, programs using other artists' work as reference? Um, and how do you think that could um, play out more in like a societal question? Because uh, at least for me, I answer it, I don't really feel comfortable with that. And to bring it to more of like the, uh, an actual thing that has happened, there's a popular site called DeviantArt, uh, who has actually stated that none of the works that are posted on their website, they absolutely forbid any AI generating based um, program using the work of their artists, uh, just completely blocking that. So I just wanted to talk about that a little bit um, and just see what your um, impression is since I just wanted to see if you could talk about that further. Those are absolutely the questions that um, artists are having. Okay, so let's go to the first thing. Um, the way that AI works or AI generated art works is it's not taking a specific piece like something you've posted up 
and creating an artwork from that. It's taking millions, if not billions of pieces of art and using those as some kind of reference when you put your text in. Now, uh, you know, the Merritt Oppenheim weirdo sculptures that I had there of belonging, those don't exist in anyone's images. They don't exist. Um, it's the AI program is actually making something that does not already exist. Okay. So for artists who are concerned that their work is being used in this way, they need to learn a little bit more about how the AI is generating this stuff. But if you don't want your work used in the sort of big batch of images that it's using to generate stuff, then um, you can try to block it. But in fact, the database of billions of images is already there. There's, I, I don't mean to be pessimistic, but there's no way to block stuff that's already been loaded up. So if you're on Instagram, for example, for years, people have been warning about Instagram that the images on it are not always yours. That is, they are being scooped up for whatever reason. Um, if you're on Facebook, same thing. If you're on Twitter, same thing. So if you're on any social media or if you're on websites where you share your artwork, the stuff has already been scooped up, but not as specific pieces, but as almost like image types. I, I don't know how else to say it. There's not a really good way to discuss this yet. And I think it's going to be really exciting for uh, art students and digital artists to come up with good ways to talk about this. But um, I understand um, that DeviantArt has put up their discussion uh, or put up their uh, objections to this. But if people have already posted stuff up on DeviantArt, like I'm, I'm a member and maybe posted five things there, it's, it's already gone. <laughs> I don't know how to say it, it's not gone. It's already been used. Um, and, but in a way you would never, ever recognize. So that if you look at the things that I generated, for example, I tried to go back and look, well, for example, at Max Ernst. Uh, yesterday, I went down the Max Ernst rabbit hole and I tried to find any specific image that he created that showed up in the thousands of <laughs> images I've generated. And there's no direct connection. So this is a great ethical question that I can't wait for the discussions to develop on. But um, we all need to have the sort of same basis in the factual information about what, a, what AI has, what AI uses to generate these new images. Does that help? Yeah, that helps a little bit. Um, I just wanted to comment a little bit uh, about how you mentioned that when you post artwork, you're kind of like relinquishing that right. Um, I have to just respectfully disagree because I think that uh, the internet is just another form of presenting your work to say like, as for example, how this gallery is like a physical way to share work. Um, I think that the internet, you know, there is still a level of like intellectual property for your work, um, especially when you have, for example, like when the artwork of artists is used by like the bigger companies, they produce it and they use it for like products and stuff like that. Um, there's a pushback to that where the artists actually have like a legal um, justification to fight against those companies. Uh, and just to like draw back to the AI thing, I think that um, I don't really agree that, you know, posting art, you're kind of relinquishing that. Of course, to a certain level, um, when you sign terms of service, when it comes to like YouTube or other types of things, they can say, oh, we can use your um, work more for like promotional stuff. I still think that as like an artist, there is a certain level of uh, protection, at least in law, that you have to protect your work. And I think that AI, at least now, um, in, you know, in its infancy, I think that it could definitely get better. But I think right now that it's kind of ignoring that in a way. Uh, because, you know, for me personally, when I post my artwork, I still technically own it, even though I am posting on the internet. But the same thing could be said of, oh, um, like, for example, if I post put this work in the gallery, if someone copied it, I could still be like, oh, well, you copied my work. I think the same thing could definitely be said about work on the internet. Um, 
but yeah, I think I, when I saw your piece, when I visited the gallery, uh, cause I'm a Brookdale student, I came in, it, I, I was really shocked cause I'd actually never seen or even imagined that AI art generated art could be seen in a gallery and I saw that and my immediate reaction was like pushback kind of. I was like, wow, like I, I can't believe that this is in a gallery. But now after you explain your process, I have a little bit much more respect for it. And I can see your own personal touches and how you explain that like, oh, I can't necessarily create my art myself. So I guess I'm more of a neutral stance now and I can much more appreciate the work that you have. And I think your presentation was phenomenal to kind of explain that process. But I think um, I still kind of stand in the sense of like, I think that there is definitely a much more ethical question for when it comes to the like property of artists and like the intellectual property, especially when images are on the internet, so. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's such a great question. That's something yeah. that we've been exploring in the gallery actually this semester. We've been doing, we did a, a piece for Civility Week where we talked about media as medium. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at these ideas, and I think Luis, you really nailed it. These are the discussions, the essential discussions of our time. Right, um, because it is a really hard thing because we want to be able to use the internet um, the way we were maybe raised to be able to use the internet, maybe the way we want to be able to use the internet. We want to, you know, for me, I'm a very private person. Um, I have a very, very real sense of, you know, my identity, my face, my image being my own. Mm -hmm. um, but Luis, you nailed it. Um, I've had people take my image and use it however they wanted to on the internet. So uh, it's, it's a pretty slippery slope. It's pretty tricky. Um, so, so yeah, I thank you so much for bringing your perspective um, yeah, to course. the conversation. I think it's fantastic. And I think, Luis, you've got a lot of people excited because we have another student who has a question <laughs> for you. Um, so, and, and the mic thing is working, so yay. So <laughs> which is like a, like a minor miracle. So technology can be a good thing. <laughs> and let me just say, I, I stopped teaching a couple of years ago, but I miss this part of teaching which is the interaction with students, so go for it. <laughs> Hi, uh, I just thought maybe you could explain or expand upon more of the notion of uh, how AI art will be used in the future or how you interpret it to be used in the future. Because um, personally, I see AI art, I'm sorry, AI art to be another tool in a, in a, multi, like a multidisciplinary person's tool set. Um, like I, I highly admire how you treated the AI image by embroidering it with the um, with the object, and it became something completely new. Um, me personally, like, I, I really just see AI art as being another tool. Um, I wanted to know if maybe that's like what you see it as as well, um, and how AI art gener generates these new images from a conglomeration of billions, trillions maybe of different images and creating something completely new. Um, just maybe you could expand upon on that more. I absolutely see it as a tool, not only for artists, but for people who are who think they are not artists like me. Um, and that's really important to me. When I was teaching anthropology and, and uh, popular culture and film, I made my I required my students to make art pieces rather than to write papers. And the reason is that kind of communication, I think, is really, really important. And many of them struggled. We made comic books, for example. Um, and everybody learned that they were capable of making art as a way of communicating their ideas, even if you could, they couldn't draw. To me, AI-generated images, I'd love to be teaching now and have students make comic books using AI because you can now create images that are in your head and get it down and hand it in as your project. It is such a great tool. Now, you have to deal with the ethical issues, but keep. I just taught a workshop on copyright issues for artists and the Supreme Court is about, <laughs> about to rule on a big artist copyright issue. Um, and watch that carefully because there have been a lot of cases um, where artists have copied other artists. I mean, sometimes directly, like I'm taking your image and I'm saying it's mine, right? And this uh, is fascinating to me uh, because can you do that? AI is a little, in a sense, safer because nobody has the same in images you have. As I showed when you generate things, you'll never get the same thing twice. And if you take somebody else's prompt, 
You won't get the same thing. And so in some ways, it's a great way to generate original um, digital images. What you do with it after that is to me really important. So I right now I'm making a quilt. So I, I, I generated this stupid image of a old crabby old woman in a dark room eating strawberries. And the image came out great. So I'm making it into a big quilt with strawberries all over it. I would never have thought of that um, without a, an image generated in this technique. So I agree with you. I think it's a tool. And I think the discussions about issues of who gets to use these tools is going to be really important in the future. And if, if there is an Afrofuturist exhibit that you guys are going to have, um, this is a this can come up there as well because there are now comic books being generated with these techniques that could you know inform your exhibit so so oh, thanks thanks yeah great question and I, I do i do just want to say it's so interesting hearing you talk about um you know who gets to make who gets to call them a creative person who gets to call themselves a creative person um and it makes me think of um virgil abloh right virgil abloh um was a was a maker. That's what he called himself, right? He was a, he had a degree in civil engineering. He had <laughs> he had a degree in civil engineering. He had um, he studied architecture, and then he started tearing apart Nikes um, and working for Gucci. And you know he made this really made. I don't know if he made it. He made this controversial chair for IKEA where he added a red rubber kind of door stopper to one of the feet. Right? And, he had, and, and 3%. He changed someone else's chair by 3% and called it his own. Right? Um, so, so it's not just AI. Right? There's so many ways we can look at these ideas of who's the maker, what does making mean, how do we lean on people who have come before us, um, you know, and, and, and where are the ethics of that. Right? I think maybe you know, hearing you talk about your work, um, it seems so engaged with, with this idea of where are the images coming from, where are the ideas coming from, where someone like Supreme certainly didn't seem very engaged with Barbara Kruger. They had no problem taking everything that she did and selling s s hoodies for $300. Um, so, so, it's, so it's really great to be able to have these conversations. Hi. So you were mentioning with your sculpture practice, um, the the works being entwined with each other, but also they connect and form larger works. Uh, my question is, do you reconfigure them with every exhibit, or are they like just singular pieces that kind of like um, stay with each other as they get exhibited? So, so the work I'm referring to, like, isn't, isn't these two pieces. Um, um, I just had some work in, um, the showcase at art fair 14 C and it was a wall piece. And I had like, it's five pieces that create one piece. And, um, in creating that piece, because it was like the first thing I created that way, I didn't think specifically about having the pieces stand on their own. They are really created to look like one piece. But part of uh, what I'm working on, one of the things I'm working on going forward are some installation ideas. And within the installation ideas, what I'd like to develop further are pieces that are connected and part of a larger kind of world, almost potentially immersive. And then, and then but they could potentially find homes individually. Um, as far as reconfiguring, the funny thing is when I first started developing this idea of connection and everything, I thought a lot about the game. Um, you might not have even, I'm old, but like they do still sell it as like a retro game and it's called um, Barrel of Monkeys. <laughs> you know, it's just game, yeah. we love that little plastic. <laughs> and all. I mean, it sounds so lame, but at the same time, like I wanted to be able to have pieces that like work together that way um, and link to, and there are a couple of sculptures I have that do work that way. There's one, I just had some uh, in a group show at um, the Ivy Brown Gallery in New York. Um, it, and it was three pieces that link together. And I have another one in the works that's done that way. Still, I'm not, I haven't developed them to be separate 
or really about reconfiguring. However, there's no reason why a piece um, from any of those couldn't be reconfigured as part of another story. You know what I mean? So like, you know, I'm not against the idea of, um, it's sort of the idea isn't that different than recycling. It's not recycling in a bad way. It's just maybe this now leads you to a whole new sculpture because it still exists, you know? And, um, and even, there's even the potential at times, and I've done this with work, where, you know, painters um, have the ability to, you know, you know, for some of the old masters, even the idea where they just scrape down the canvas or don't even scrape down the canvas and re-gesso and work a thing. So the way I'm working without going crazy, I can potentially take a sculpture um, where I'm not that pleased with the drawing or I've changed my tune about it and rework that and then it becomes a whole new piece. And I don't, because I'm not glazing, um, which I didn't really get into and I'll be really quick, but like I, <laughs> I didn't really get into the fact that I've kind of let go of my, uh, you know, very traditional ceramic background where once a piece is fired, it's done. Um, in this way, I'm painting it, I'm drawing on it. Why can't I do whatever I want to the piece? It's sculpture. Um, so basically using components that way is definitely something I'm considering continuing to do and um, building upon in my, in my body of work. So you're, you're right on target. I just don't have anything to tell you about yet. So just thank you again to the artists for being with us this evening. And a huge thank you to Mammoth Arts for being amazing and supporting all of the programming for this show.